صلوا على محمد وعلي محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Respected elders, brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Last night we spoke about the kingdom of Sulaiman alayhi salam and some of the unique abilities and miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him. One of the reasons why Luqman, uh, Sulaiman alayhi salam had asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for political power and for political dominance is actually noted by Al-Allam Al-Majlisi in Bihar Al-Anwar. We have a narration that says, وَإِنَّمَا سَأَلَ الْمُلْكِ The reason why, or one of the reasons why, Sulaiman had asked Allah to grant him a mighty kingdom, is for what reason? لِيَقْهَرَ مُلُوكَ الْكُفْرِ He wanted a mighty kingdom, he wanted that power, so that he could overpower the infidel kings of the time. He wanted to spread the message of God on earth, and sometimes it becomes necessary to use force in certain circumstances. There are certain dynasties that are so corrupt, they will not surrender unless you use military force. So Sulaiman alayhi salam, he asks for this power, and this is one of the reasons why he makes that request. Now, Sulaiman alayhi salam, among his duties as a king, one of his main duties as a king was to raise an army, a sophisticated army, to defend his kingdom and to also expand his empire. You know, today, secular nations, they also expand their empires, but they do it for worldly reasons, and oftentimes they're dishonest with the international community, they want to spread democracy, but it's all a lie. Ultimately, it's about increasing their access to valuable resources. Sulaiman wants to expand his empire for godly reasons. He wants to expand his empire and bring people closer to a way of life that will allow them to live prosperously in dunya and in akhirah. Now, in terms of the army of Sulaiman, Sulaiman had a unique army. And there are verses in the Holy Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the army of Sulaiman. So for example, in Surah An-Naml, Surah 27, Ayah 17, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak to us about the makeup of the army of Sulaiman. Qala ta'ala, وَحُشِرَ لِسُلَيْمَانَ جُنُودُهُ the army of Sulaiman was gathered. They were assembled. And who was in this army? The first group that makes up the army of Sulaiman is the jinn. Right? He's probably the, the only, it's probably the only military in the world that has a contingency of jinn. There's a, a hidden force in the army of Sulaiman. Min al jinni wal ins. Of course, the army of Sulaiman is also made up of human beings. This is not a kingdom and it's not 
a, a, a government that is reliant on supernatural abilities. No, there are human beings that are also participating. من الجن والإنس والطير. Interestingly, the army of Sulaiman is also comprised of birds. The birds also were a part of his army. فهم يوزعون. And they were arranged in ranks and orders based on which group they belonged to. The jinn, they had their own contingency, their own brigades. The jinn had their own brigades. And the birds also played a role in the, the army of Sulaiman. Now Sulaiman alayhi salam, he was, a king, he, was, he was a prophet of God, he was a king, but also his role also demanded that he was to act as the commander of chief of the military. And hence, Sulaiman alayhi salam used to personally oversee the selection and the training of his soldiers. So Sulaiman was very strict about who is to be enlisted in his army. You know, it's very similar to the story that we had with Talut. This is not an army that's fighting for worldly games. This is an army that is fighting for the sake of God. And therefore, the standard is higher than what you would see in secular governments. Right? This is not a secular army. So Sulaiman, he would choose people to join this army. He would train them. And he was so meticulous and so involved in the preparations for jihad that he used to also choose the horses that would be used in jihad. This means that he took the defense of his empire very seriously. And he took the potential threats of his enemies very seriously. This is not someone who has this mindset that we are the, the most powerful army in the world and there's a bit of complacency. No, there's no complacency in the ranks of Sulaiman. Now there's an interesting ayah in the Qur'an that tells us about an incident where Sulaiman is inspecting the quality of the horses. And something strange happens, and I'll share with you these verses. If we go to Surah Sa'd, Surah 38 of the Qur'an, ayah 31. It seems that on the eve of one of the battles, Sulaiman alayhi salam, from the, from the afternoon until sunset, he was busy inspecting and ensuring that the horses were ready for battle. It seems that this was something that was urgent and important and it demanded the attention of Sulaiman. So the Quran says, إِذْ عُرِضَ عَلَيْهِ بِالْعَشِيِّ الصَّافِنَاتُ In the late afternoon, according to the Quran, this الصَّافِنَاتُ الْجِيَادِ They were presented to Sulaiman. Now what is the meaning of صَافِنَاتُ الْجِيَادِ The word صَافِنَات is the plural of صَافِنَة. So this is a description of the horses. They were horses, they were, the horses were presented to Sulaiman and the horses are described as poised. So the first description is that these horses are poised. So these are horses that have been trained for battle. These are horses that are disciplined. As-safinatul jihad. So jihad is either the plural of jayid or the plural of jawad. So Sulaiman alayhi salam spends several hours from afternoon until sunset inspecting these horses. And what does the Quran say? فَقَالَ إِنِّي أَحْبَبْتُ حُبَّ الْخَيْرِ عَنْ ذِكْرِ رَبِّي Sulaiman, he loved horses. 
And not only did he love horses, but he especially loved these horses because they were race horses and they were horses that were breeded, they were bred to use for warfare. So they were very dear to him. And he spent hours inspecting them because Suleiman does not want to lose in any of these battles. The Quran says, Hatta tawarat bil hijab. We have some ayat that say, while he was busy inspecting the horses, the sun had set. The sun had set, and the narrations say that he missed the afternoon prayer. Now, you might, you might be thinking, how is it possible for a prophet of God to miss the afternoon prayer? Allama Taba Taba in Tafsir al Mizan, he has an interesting discussion here. He accepts the narrations that say, that speak about the setting of the sun. And he says, Suleiman did not commit a sin because there are two obligatory actions here. It is wajib to fight jihad fi sabilillah. He was preparing for an imminent battle with mushrikeen. So this was something that was obligatory upon him to ensure that his horses, his army was ready for battle. It was wajib and it was urgent. And salah was also wajib. And whenever you have a conflict between two obligatory actions, the one that is more important and pressing is going to take priority. So he actually did the right thing. So I'll give an example. Imagine you wake up for, for Salat al-Fajr. And let's say that you wake up and it's about 15 minutes until sunrise. You wake up at this, from the moment you wake up, it is wajib upon you to pray Salat al-Fajr. But let's say as you're doing wudu, you look out the window and there's someone drowning in the pond in your backyard. Or let's say that there's a swimming pool and you see someone drowning. Now there is a second wajib upon you. Because you see that there's another human being who's drowning, it is now wajib upon you to save the life of this drowning person. So there are two wajibs. The wajib of performing salah and the wajib of saving someone who's drowning. Now what do you do? You have a religious duty to do, especially if you can't do both of them, if you have to choose, you have a choice now. I either pray Salat al-Fajr on time and I let the person drown, or I save the person and I pray Salat al-Fajr qada. Your duty is to do what? It's to prioritize the more important obligation, which is the saving of a human life. And you did not commit a sin, even though you would have to pray qada. You fulfilled your duty. You prioritized the obligation that is more important. Allama says the same thing. He says, Sulaiman did not commit a sin. Because if he doesn't prepare this army for battle, he will be defeated by his enemies. He was focusing on the more important obligation, which is inspecting the horses to ensure that they are ready for battle. And he missed his prayer, and that's fine. Because he simply prioritized a more important obligation. Other scholars, they say, that explanation is okay, it's fine. They say that, who says the prayer that Sulaiman missed was an obligatory one? Because the ayah in the Quran says what? In ayah 33, I believe. Some narrations say that he says to the angels, who, are, who control the rising and the setting of the sun, he says to the angels, send it back. Meaning, send back the sun so that I can perform 
my prayer on time. Some mufassireen, they say that if it was a wajib prayer that he missed, he simply prioritized the more important wajib. And some scholars say that no, what he missed was a recommended salah. And because he never wanted to miss a recommended prayer, he asked for the sun to be returned. Now another interpretation that we find is some mufassireen, especially the non-Shia mufassireen, they say that Sulaiman was very fond of horses. Yes, he was preparing them for jihad, but he was taken by their beauty and he was, he was enjoying his time with them. And he, he missed his prayer. And the ayah that says, send them back, refers to the horses. Bring them back. And he actually slaughtered the horses and distributed their meat. Because he said that these horses distracted me from the remembrance of my Lord. But our ulama, they say that it's inconceivable that Sulaiman would punish the horses for his own heedlessness. So again, this is one of the verses in the Qur'an that's subject to a number of different interpretations. But nonetheless, we see in this ayah that Sulaiman salam as a prophet of God is not a pacifist. This is an important lesson. Sometimes you have people who teach religion in a way where they say that, oh, religion is always about peace and we should all... Islam is not a religion of peace. Islam is a religion of justice. Sometimes justice is achieved through peaceful diplomacy, but there are certain cases where peace cannot be established through diplomacy. It can only be established through military intervention. And this is what we see in the lives of the prophets. Now, Sulaiman alayhi salam, the narrations tell us that after finishing the renovations of the temple, you know, the temple of Solomon that we're familiar with, the ahadith say that after he finished the renovations of the temple, he set out with his army to go perform hajj. Now hajj is not just something that was mandated upon the prophet's community. Every single prophet of God was required to perform the pilgrimage in Mecca from the time of Adam until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Hajj is upon all people who meet the conditions. So Sulaiman salam, he takes his entire army with him to Hajj. And they march. So imagine you have human beings, you have jinn, you have these birds that are flying over Sulaiman's head. They're creating this kind of canopy. If we were to see the, the entourage of Sulaiman, the caravan of Sulaiman going for Hajj, it definitely would have been something that would have caught our attention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in Surah An-Naml, He mentions an incident that took place as they are going towards Hajj. As the army of Sulaiman is traveling from Jerusalem to Mecca, they pass by a colony of ants. And this is what is mentioned in the Quran in Surah An-Naml, which is the chapter of the ants, ayah number 18. Hatta idha atau ala wad naml Until they passed, they meaning Sulaiman and his entourage, until they passed a colony of ants, a valley of ants. And then the Quran says what? قَالَتْ نَمْلَةٌ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّمْلُ اُدْخُلُوا مَسَاكِنَكُمْ لَا يَحْطِمَنَّكُمْ سُلَيْمَانُ وَجُنُودُ وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ One of the ants says to its community, to the other ants, one female ant issues an alarm to the other ants, saying, oh ants, Take cover. Go into your homes so that 
you will not be trampled by Sulaiman and his army while they don't realize it. Now this ayah from Surah An-Naml, many of you may not know this, but if you've ever had debates and conversations with Christian polemicists, this ayah is often used to refute the Qur'an as being the Word of God. Why? The argument goes as follows. The Qur'an says, قَالَتْ نَمْلَةٌ The ant said, and the Qur'an also mentions how Sulaiman was amused by the words of the ant. Some say that if you look at the way that ants communicate, they say ants don't communicate through words. So for example, if you look, the argument is that your Qur'an says, this is what they say, your Qur'an says that Sulaiman heard the ant, but science tells us that ants, they don't produce sound. They don't communicate that way. Now, the reason why this argument doesn't hold is that if you look at the research on how ants communicate, the research actually shows that ants communicate in five ways. There are five ways in which an uh, ant communicates. Number one is ants communicate through scent, through pheromones. Right? Their, their antennas can detect these pheromones. So there, there are no words that are being used. No noise is being generated. So this is one mode of communication. The second is touch. Ants communicate through touch. They touch each other using their antennas. Number three, ants also communicate through motion and body language. Right? So just like human beings, you know, human beings, they give each other a thumbs up or a high five, for example. Ants also communicate in a similar way. They use motion and body language. And there are some, not all, there are some species of ants that communicate through sound. There are some ants that do communicate through sound because there are many different species of ants. And then you have the final mode of communication which is uh, trophallaxis where through they, 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 they basically touch each other's mouths and they exchange food with each other and through that way they communicate. Now going back to the ayah, when the ant says to the fellow ants, get into your home so you are not trampled by Sulaiman and his army, notice the Qur'an is very precise with its words. The Qur'an says about Sulaiman's reaction, فَتَبَسَّمَ ضَاحِكًا مِّنْ قَوْلِهَا Sulaiman smiled because he understood what the ant communicated. The ayah doesn't say that Sulaiman sami'a qawlaha. The Quran doesn't say Sulaiman heard what the ant said. It basically says that Sulaiman comprehended what the ant said and the comment of the ant made Sulaiman salam smile. Now, when Sulaiman heard, when, when he was able to understand, the communication of the ant, he summoned the ant. It troubled him that these ants are afraid of him. That they, they're afraid for their safety. So the hadith says that Sulaiman summons the ant. He tells the ant, come, I want to speak to you. And the narration says, Ya ayyatuha namla, O ant, أَمَا عَلِمْتِ أَنِّي نَبِيُّ اللَّهِ وَأَنِّي لَا أَظْلِمُ أَحَدًا Suleiman says to the ant that, Oh ant, don't you know that I am a prophet of God? And a prophet of God would never wrong or oppress any creature. So Suleiman is basically saying that, Why do you have such a negative 
opinion of me, that you think that I would be so reckless. The ant said, No, I know that you're a prophet of God. I know that you would not trample us. So Suleiman says, then why did you tell all the other ants to take cover? The ant says to Suleiman that I feared that my fellow ants might gaze upon your mighty army and they might be distracted from the remembrance and their duty to Allah. I thought that it might affect them. It might distract them. And this is what made Suleiman smile. فَتَبَسَّمَ ضَاحِكًا مِّنْ قَوْلِهَا Because Suleiman would not smile at the fact that ants are terrified of him. What would make him smile is that this ant has so much God consciousness that it's more afraid of its fellow ants being distracted from the army of Sulaiman and be distracted from their duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَتَبَسَّمَ ضَاحِكًا مِّنْ قَوْلِهَا Sulaiman alayhi salam, he reaches Mecca. We have a beautiful narration that gives us an account of a speech that Sulaiman delivered in Mecca. Al Majlisi, he mentions this in Biharul Anwar. The narration says, وَقَالَ لِمَنْ حَضَرَ مِنْ أَشْرَافِ قَوْمٍ Sulaiman, he delivered a sermon. Where? In Mecca. At Hajj. What does he say? He says to his nobles, he says to all of those who are attending Hajj with him, He says to his people that in this land there will emerge an Arab prophet. So it's not just Isa alayhi salam who is prophesizing the advent of the last messenger. Sulaiman is also speaking about the prophet of Akhirul Zaman. Sifatuhu kada wa kada. Sulaiman begins describing the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the final messenger of God, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, he will be given victory over all of his enemies. His enemies, his enemies, the enemies of the Prophet in the end of times, will be instilled with awe of him to a distance of one month travel in every direction. And this is indeed what happens. During the time of the Prophet, the, the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire, they're all afraid of this new religious movement. The one who is close to him and the one who is distant from him is treated fairly. It's a description of the Prophet. He is not perturbed by the naysayers. As much as Quraysh try to dissuade him to continue his mission, he's steadfast. Suleiman is describing the Prophet. The listeners, those who are with Suleiman, they say to him that what religion is he going to follow? Suleiman says that he will follow the tradition of Ibrahim. Deenul Hanifiyyah, the tradition of Ibrahim. And then Sulaiman, he says, Sulaiman says, Glad tidings to those who witness that final prophet. And glad tidings be to those who believe in him. 
and support him. So they ask Sulaiman, فَكَمْ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَ خُرُوجِهِ يَا نَبِيَ اللَّهِ When will this final messenger be sent to humanity? Sulaiman says in approximately 1,000 years. And Sulaiman was about 1,000 years before the, the Prophet. And then look at what he says. فَلْيُبَلِّغُ الشَّاهِدُ مِنْكُمْ الْغَائِبُ This is exactly what the Prophet says in his speech in Ghadir. Let those who are present inform those who are absent. Sulaiman says, this description that I am giving you of the final Prophet of God, I want you to notify all of those who are not with us. So part of the mandate of Sulaiman salam is to pave the way for the final messenger of God by making his descriptions known among Bani Israel. That's why the Quran, when Allah speaks about the Jews in Medina, Allah is very severe in his condemnation of them. Because Allah says, يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ they know the final messenger of God better than they know their own children. They're intimately familiar with the descriptions of Rasulullah because all of these prophets are speaking about the coming of the Prophet. Now after Sulaiman salam finishes Hajj, he now is heading back to Jerusalem. Now, of course, when you're traveling with an army that is that big, you have to be very calculated in where you stop. You're traveling through deserts, and an army like that needs rest, needs food, you get thirsty. So they stop at a resting station, presumably to, to drink water, to pray, to freshen up. Now, the Qur'an tells us that Sulaiman, as I mentioned, part of his army was that he had birds. When he would travel, the birds would fly above his head. One of the things that happens is that Sulaiman recognizes that one of his birds is missing. How does he notice? Because as he's sitting, he notices a ray of light shining on him. He looks up and there is one bird that is missing from the aerial formation. So the Quran says in ayah number 20 of Surah An-Naml, وَتَفَقَّدَ الطَّيْرِ He was missing the bird. The hudhud. The Quran mentions the hudhud. The hoopoo bird. Now the hoopoo bird had a, a unique duty in the army of Sulaiman. The role of this bird was to do what? Whenever they stopped, Sulaiman would tell the hoodhood, tell us where water is. So the hoodhood would fly and then signal to Sulaiman that I found water nearby and they would go and retrieve water. So Sulaiman, the Quran says, وَتَفَقَّدَ الطَّيْرِ He looked up and he saw that the hudhud was missing. فَقَالَ مَا لِيَ لَا أَرَى الْهُدْهُدْ Why is it that I don't see the hoopoe bird? أَمْ كَانَ مِنَ الْغَائِبِينَ Did he not show up? Where is he? Ayah number 21. لَأُعَذِّبَنَّهُ عَذَابًا شَدِيدًا I will severely punish him. Sulaiman is very strict. You cannot run a country. You cannot be the commander of an army if you don't establish a culture of discipline. If Sulaiman said, oh, if the bird is missing, oh, it's okay. What would happen? Soldiers will stop showing up and people will think that, oh, Sulaiman is very easy, easy going. And then suddenly you have a kingdom that is vulnerable to attack. 
So Suleiman wants to send a message that look at how strict I am when a bird is missing. You can only imagine what I would do to a soldier of mine who doesn't show up. I'm going to severely punish him or I might even slaughter him. Or, Suleiman is also fair. These are the punishments if he doesn't have a good excuse, but there's also a path to redemption. I'll let him defend himself. If he has a good reason why he was absent, then there is no punishment. Ayah number 22. The bird was flying back. The hudhud tells Sulaiman, O Sulaiman, I have become aware of information that you are not aware of. I've just come back from Sheba, which is in Yemen. And I have an accurate report to give you. And inshallah, tomorrow night, we'll speak about the news that the Hudhud brings to Sulaiman. And inshallah, we'll, we'll go through the story of his interaction with the Queen of Sheba. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi tahirin.